I wanted to introduce the session. Uh, this is our education area. We're talking about uh, hospitality stronger together as our overall theme. And this particular se session, uh, reshaping hospitality education. We've put together a, a really good panel from different parts of, of our region, uh, different types of schools, and then one uh, administrator on this. So what we'll be doing is each question uh, will be addressed to one of the participants. They'll have four minutes. Then we'll have another four minutes where the other participants can uh, ask a question of the, of the panelist, another question, or comment with something uh, from their experience on that also. And then at the end, we'll have about 20 minutes to do the Q&A that comes, comes in from the rest of the audience on that. So um, our topic today is, is really relevant because of how much COVID has affected hospitality education. I'm sure we've all had different experiences. You know, at CMU, we had to start uh, or stop about two or three weeks before and change over to fully online. So it's been quite an experience for all of us. Um, I'd like to start with Allison Green, Associate Dean of Academics and Accreditation, University of West Florida. So your question, what are your program's initial responses to the pandemic and how do you modify your delivery methods and or expectations to accommodate students, faculty and staff? That is a good question and it will last 30 seconds. We did what everybody else did. We went online. You know, in all seriousness, though, we did, right? We all went online um, and we scrambled to do that. However, now um, I know one of them is to reflect back. When we were in the moment, let me address um, a couple of things that I feel our department did very, very well, which was what, what is now you're hearing is the high flex. And so, we have a small department, really the faculty are active teaching type of styles. And so a lot of the content prior to this was already online in Canvas. They were already using tools such as Google Sites and, and, and Google Drive. They were seamlessly doing that while they were face to face. And so it was really easy when everybody went online. Uh, to reach out to the students. So that part of it, although abrupt, at least in our department, I can also speak to the College of Business. Uh, it wasn't that easy. Not everybody was prepped that way. And so going on uh, line, I think everybody just did the same thing. I would also like to say um, that at that time, we also came together as faculty and staff once a week. That was our lifeline during the last seven, eight weeks. We didn't realize that at that time was a lifeline, not only to all of us that we, we were actually sharing best practices, uh, but also it was to the students because then we would take what we knew and brought it to the students. and. The online environment, we are not used to the on online environment. We have small classrooms. That's why we're so specialized. Uh, and so that's also what we did. That was our different mode at that time. So instead of no communication, we actually pulled in the communication within the department to the students, the staff, and of course the faculty. So those were um, those were the highlights of what modes we went. So having one faculty meeting a semester um, per the bylaws, all of a sudden changed to every single week we would get together. And again, it became that lifeline. Um, and I would say that going back to high impact practices, so those really drove this 
this time online to also reach out to industry. And um, so although it looked different and we couldn't go out and talk to industry or, or go out and um, visit locations to do some field trips, we still continue doing that just online. So the creativity. So those were, I don't think that's four minutes, but uh, really that's what we did. We did what everybody else did. I uh, don't like the word pivot, but we did things that were very unique and um, highly engaging. Uh, panelists, do you have any follow-up on that? You want to call on yes. us or just yeah, jump no, in? Just jump in. Uh, there's a few things that, that we did uh, uh, right away, in addition to pivoting, of course, in the classroom and that sort of thing, um, to try to minimize some of the negative effects. Uh, so we, we changed uh, the grading uh, uh, ways that students had opportunities to do, basically like a, a pass with COVID effects kind of thing. Um, uh, we um, also addressed some issues with our, our faculty and PhD students in terms of the impact on their research. So uh, giving them an extension for their tenure for a year um, if they chose to, and for uh, PhD students if they needed to stick around uh, for a while longer than normal, uh, because uh, a lot of the research got uh, impacted, particularly they were doing experimental type uh, things uh, that we had planned. Um, and then uh, also uh, ha having a COVID statement. So we, we have annual, annual reviews coming up. And so having a COVID statement in terms of how that affected them, because it differentially affected our, our faculty and staff differently, depending on their home life, right? So some actually were pretty productive in terms of their uh, their research and were able to ramp it up. Others were, you know, they're uh, homeschooling and that kind of thing, it really had a negative effect. So having that flexibility uh, was, was very important right away. Uh, the, the other thing was, um, you know, a lot, a lot of our courses that were, you know, lecture based or whatever, we, we were pretty easy to, to move that over to a remote delivery through um, a synchronous delivery or asynchronous or whatever. And initially, the challenges were the lab classes, uh, culinary labs and beverage labs in terms of how that would take place. So, but our, our faculty uh, got pretty creative in terms of uh, um, being able to do that through some um, video methods and conferences and and uh, shipping out samples of, uh, of vials of uh, wines for wine tasting, much like we did for the wine tasting here later. So uh, those are some of the examples that we did. Thank you. Good. Dr. Shoemaker? Yeah, I was going to say just that UNLV, you know, sort of to echo what, what others have said, but we did, um, we actually paid our faculty in the summer. Um, we offered a variety of classes through, um, you know, through IT, the IT department and through online education where faculty could take courses to learn how to teach online um, or, you know, synchronous online. Um, I took a lot of the courses along with the faculty, um, and and that was really beneficial. Our faculty also, we've been working with with online technology. We hired actually someone from the, from a online technology who works in our college fifty percent of his time that we pay for, and he's created kind of a message board where all our faculty get together to kind of share best practices and and talk about issues and things like that. I think the key thing that that so I taught in the fall, a high flex class, and then um, took over for another faculty member who had to take a, take a quick break. And I think the thing that I'd learned from it was that it's a very different learning style from the student's perspective, um, online versus remote, synchronous, asynchronous, in that in the classroom, it's it seems much more active. You can really just go right after the students and blah, blah, blah with them. At, in the online environment, it's kind of passive. So really learning how to um, get the students to be engaged in an online environment was is something that I think I've talked to our faculty about, or you know, through the department chairs, that we really create a video or something that says, when taking a class online, it's different than showing up in class. Here are things that makes you that will help me make you a better student. So we're trying to implement things like that here at UNLV to make it a a better experience for the students. Good. Um, Can I, I think we could talk about this for the whole time. Uh, you may got a quick one. Yeah. Before we move to. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, I just want to chime in. It seems like everything everybody has said. Check, check, check. We've done all of those things as well. 
And don't forget, we still had diversity, equity, and inclusion that were issues that were taking place. Don't forget, um, there was a snowstorm that just hit. And so now we have faculty without power and electricity, and we're trying to figure out who needs water. So I think it's very important for us at this time that we have to be resilient. Um, as leaders, we have to be resilient. As faculty, we have to be resilient, and we have to model this for them. Um, and, and I agree with um, Ali that I don't like the word pivot either. It makes me think of a basketball play on a court. But I feel like that's exactly what we're doing. Thank you, Ali, for demonstrating. But I feel like that's exactly what we're doing because, you know, we had COVID and then we went to online. Then they're saying, please get some classes face to face. So now I'm asking faculty, can it be, please be face to face during the pandemic? Then there's a snowstorm. So now everybody has pivoted back to online learning again. So I, I think this is where we are, that we need to figure out ways. I attended the Ruxby um, presentation earlier, trying to find simulations, trying to find these supplemental resources to help us to be more engaging in these online platforms are extremely helpful. And then one more thing I'm going to add really quick quickly is that I enjoyed our provost did a phenomenal job of keeping us informed of all of the impacts and and then I was able to share this and be transparent with our faculty um, so that they were prepared as these decisions were, were coming along but I think I think we can all say this but I know our faculty at UNT did a fan, phenomenal job with everything that was thrown at them at once and still managing home because they still have a life outside of academia um, and juggling all these different balls. But I think this is where we are for sure that we have to be resilient. Good. Um, we had a question on what is what high flex, but let's hold that till later because we're a couple of minutes behind already. Uh, Dr. Harrington, um, in looking back the past 11 months, what were the biggest challenges presented by COVID to your program and how have you resolve, resolved them? So uh, probably like everyone else, the, the first main challenge and, and, and the ongoing challenge is the uncertainty, right? In terms of, you know, we spent all summer trying to figure out, uh, are we going to be able to offer a face-to-face -face versus remote versus some sort of hybrid high flex or what that might look like and that sort of thing. And so uh, we ended up, we're still um, delivering everything uh, remotely. And so we're planning to uh, go to face-to-face -to -face in, in the fall. So that was the initial uh, big challenge and, and frustration. But if I break it into kind of some buckets, I was thinking uh, from uh, you know external to the actual teaching part was uh, recruiting. Um, and normally, you know, that's done very much face to face, and, and we had a plan put together for those sorts of things, which uh, had to be uh, changed. Uh, industry relations, um, when, when you have an industry that uh, is uh, hard hit by, uh, you know, the, the pandemic and, and that sort of thing, and ha having to have their deal with their own uncertainty, uh, you know, tapping into them uh, can be a challenge. Um, study abroad is, is a huge issue uh, for, it's a requirement of, of our business students in the college to get international learning. And so when all of those kept getting canceled and, and uh, we still don't have any offer this summer, uh, we, we, we pivoted on that. And then, uh, of course, the uh, work experience internship uh, requirement. Our students are required to do 1,000 hours before they graduate. And so if they're not able to work, uh, uh, how, how do we deal with that? So I, I know a couple of these things are going to be talked about uh, by some of the panelists a little bit later. A couple I wanted to touch on, if I have time, is um, so probably, you know, um, the, the, the industry relations piece. Um, so, um, you know, as everyone probably, you know, we shifted to, you know, virtual career fairs, um, virtual tours instead of direct immersion and, and, and visits to facilities. Uh, but some of the things we were able to to maintain or keep up were, um, you know, mentoring programs with our, from our advisory boards, with our students and, and those sorts of things and industry folks, because that could be done remotely and, and be very beneficial in this environment where the students need to be resilient in terms of as well, uh, what they need to look at. Um, we also, um, tapped into some industries that um, we're closely aligned with, but maybe aren't traditional uh, hospitality uh, type businesses. So our senior living uh, degree program that we started, they were continuing to hire uh, throughout the pandemic and still are. Um, we have connections with the, the veterinary hospital group uh, that was interested in hiring our graduates uh, to bring more hospitality into their type of business. Um, Wine and beverage businesses have been pretty successful throughout the pandemic because people are still drinking, fortunately, uh, uh, so uh, which we'll be doing later, as I mentioned earlier. 
this theme with me, maybe, I don't know. Uh, I'll shift, shift, shift the idea there. Uh, and then food businesses like, uh, you know, Simplot, Tyson, that sort of thing, uh, like to hire our graduates from time to time. So uh, making our students aware of other opportunities and how, um, you know, their business skill set applies to a, a variety of industries and, and types of opportunities where they can take advantage of that as well. Um, and then in terms of um, study abroad, um, so, uh, Currently, you know, bringing in more international um, connected learning uh, classroom uh, environments. So connecting with uh, international partners uh, to bring them into the classroom. Um, and so we have that, uh, that sort of thing ongoing and then uh, ramping up, uh, you know, 2022, uh, doing some more um, study abroad that'll take place over spring break as well as summer and, and regular semesters to, uh, and then offering more international business type courses that uh, fulfill the immediate requirement for study abroad for our students in terms of uh, some international learning and that sort of thing. Um, another another issue if I still have time, I don't know if I'm going over my four minutes or not, but. Uh, yeah, I think you're a little over, but let's, let's go one more. All right, all right. Um, another issue that we actually had um, was um, in our college and actually in hospitality, our, our student enrollment was up 50% in the college and 21% in hospitality. And uh, so uh, it forced us to use a system-wide kind of sharing approach to allow students to enroll in the different campuses across our system. So I think uh, that'll be very beneficial for us going forward that we can think outside of the box as a, as a university community uh, to do some things maybe we haven't done in the past. That's great. Uh, real, real quick, anybody have something before we move to the next question? So that, that was really good. And I'm sure we've all had different challenges and again, each one of these questions we could talk the whole time on. Did you have something, um, Dr. Williams? Yes, yeah, so I was gonna add really quickly, um, another big challenge was Zoom fatigue. And I think ensuring that we keep our internal and external constituents engaged has been a big challenge for us. So that creativity, I mean, Robert was so exhaustive in, in everything that he discussed. So he did a fantastic job there. But I mean, at creativity, we have to continue to be creative because the longer this goes on with Zoom, I'm afraid that we lose students. I'm afraid that we lose industry partners. So we have to be very creative in a way that we deliver content to them to keep them engaged. Good. Uh, John Marshall, Vice President for Student Services at Colorado Mesa. Um, CMU has been recognized for its response to COVID-19. Please describe the university's response from student, faculty, staff, and community perspectives. How has this evolved over the last uh, 11 months? And then what trends or permanent changes do you see from the future? So this is more from an administrative perspective. Britt, thanks so much for the question. Thanks to my partners on the panel here uh, for letting me join. Quick word about Colorado Mesa. We're about 250 miles from anywhere. Mountain passes any direction you want to go. So we're smack dab between Denver and Salt Lake. And in some regards, that has helped us in this pandemic. We we were able to avoid the initial surge. Um, and, and I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. But what it really means is that we have always survived on partnerships. And so I really want to dive into what that looks like with our community. The initial question you asked is, how did our students respond? Well, we, we went out and we surveyed our students um, about in April. Kim, I think you you raised this question about, about how are our more vulnerable student populations responding? And so we went ahead and surveyed them. And at CMU in particular, we serve um, disproportionately first generation, low income and students of color. And so two out of three of our students are gonna fall in one of those categories. So as we went out and, and surveyed those students, um, by the way, uh, you know, Robert, I think you talked a little bit about you know, the pass fail and some of these academic accommodations we were all working through. And what we found with our most vulnerable populations is that they weren't doing well. They were not doing well in this online environment. And what we came to in late April was uh, we sat down as a management team and with the university president and the Board of Trustees, and we came to uh, put a flag in the ground. We said, we've got a moral imperative to be face-to-face -face this fall. We've got to figure out how to do this in order to make sure that this vulnerable population um, continues to have access to education. So, 
So we planted that flag and we got to work developing community partnerships. Our Mesa County Public Health um, has been unbelievable. They, from the get-go, all the way back to last February, we, had, we started with a relatively small group and we started working week to week. Our hospitals, uh, public health, and a team within the university that was working on this, what became our safe together, strong together, return to campus plan. And what we ultimately did, and I'm gonna share screen um, with you, give you a, a couple of visuals, because I think it, it helps you maybe get our arms around this. But um, part of what we did is we went out and we worked to develop a series of partners. We, we partnered with a group called COVID Check Colorado, which was a spinoff of the Gary Community Investments, a philanthropic organization that helped stand up mass testing. And so we were at sort of the tip of the spear we redeployed about 100 staff members, people that whose jobs in student life and athletics and a variety of things were disrupted. And frankly, they didn't have a lot to do when students left. And we redeployed those folks and stood up a mass testing facility. We partnered with the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT um, at first on a consultation basis um, and then became a much more hands-on component and I want to show you in part what we were able to develop together and this I think gives you maybe some insight as to uh, how we went about addressing an in-person fall experience. What you're looking at here is uh, a dashboard that was developed with some developers out of MIT that assisted us and we, like many institutions, we used our mobile devices for kind of an electronic passport. So every day students would have a green screen, right? So Britt is gaveling down his class and students need to show that they have done their daily attestation and they are compliant with their testing. So it shows us real quickly, I can see how many people have attested that day. Um, I can then quickly look at testing. And by the way, this is not PHI, this is a demonstration uh, screen, so lest you think we're and cavalier with HIPAA. Um, but what we can see is this within the hour, I can see positives, I can see um, where they might stay, and quickly we can then look into dorms. And so this is a dorm view, uh, again, a simulated dorm view, but what it shows you is when you look on that floor, I can quickly see I've got a positive here, I've got other students that needs to, uh, we need to get in there and do some work here. Over on the right here, you're looking at what we call our Mavlies. So we're the Colorado Mesa University Mavericks. And so you put a Maverick and a family together. We developed these family units that we call Mavlies. And these are um, athletics and uh, apartments on campus and study groups and, and these family units that we really built our strategy around. Uh, and it also allowed us to start seeing trends within the community and those housing areas outside of our immediate campus and all those things together really allowed us to get surgical in decision making. We stood up a, a testing site for a campus of 10,000. We ended up doing about 30, 36, maybe 37,000 tests or so throughout the fall, uh, really structured around where those Mavely units are, around residence life, around performing arts, around athletics and a variety of others to really get surgical about how we go about this. Uh, we also partnered with our faculty in the sciences and uh, engineering to stand up wastewater testing as well as building out our own internal uh, lab to be able to run rapid saliva lamp assays. And all told what that really allowed us to do was get very very clear about what was happening and as the fall went on um, we were able to partner again with the Broad Institute to start doing genomic sequencing of our positives. And so at this stage, we're now sequencing every single positive that comes out of our testing site here. Um, last week, we found the uh, British B117 variant for the first time, something we never would have had line of sight into were it not for our good partners um, on the East Coast. The last thing I'll mention is culture. And, and I think what you found with the institution, and I think we've shared a, a couple of links on these, but I'll, I'll maybe put them in the, I don't know where I'm supposed to put them, Britt, whether it's in the chat or in the Q&A, but um, a couple of fun YouTube videos that our, our students help 
drive. And I think that culture mattered a lot and continues to matter a lot in terms of the success that we've had on campus. So um, I recognize I'm bumping against my time here, Britt. Happy to answer questions. Um, but I, again, grateful to be on this panel with you all. Good. Other questions, comments? Got a couple of minutes. Anybody? Um, I've, I've got one um, on there. The, the, do you see any permanent changes from this? From this? Um, one of the things that we've done is, you know, in terms of our testing sites, I, I can't remember who among our panelists, maybe it was Ali, that talked about this need to take um, practicum and uh, hands-on kind of work. And what do you do with students when they can't do that work? So one of the things we, we did was we took um, all of those health sciences students who could no longer do their clinical rotations and work in the hospitals, and we moved them into testing. I think what that has done uh, more broadly for us is created a much tighter bond between us and our community. So our business community, our chamber of commerce, our economic partnerships, uh, all of those areas, I think, are now seeing these opportunities for our students to play a role in our students to be able to see themselves as not simply being interns or out there working on classes, but being an integral part of a community response. And I, I hope, I believe, that's something that's going to last with us, recognizing this pool of talent, um, not simply as, as uh, students necessarily, but as those who are really actively helping support their community um, in this particular case as, as a pandemic, but I, I think that's going to last. Good. Can I, well, thank can you. I add something real quick? Um, because I think this is where what's so unique with hospitality education, and I'm talking to like-minded people, I know this, but it is very different from other um, programs, other colleges, in the fact that we are so tied to the industry when our industry went down, we all felt it. It wasn't just a, I can't get internships, what are we doing to fill that type of thing? It, is, it was probably the greatest life lesson that we could all feel together as one in hospitality education as well as industry. So taking advantage of talking to the community, especially in our smaller community, getting to know, we did a series of round tables. We brought students into that so they could see this was real and how real leaders are making the difference. So that to me is what we're moving forward with is connecting at that real level versus we're in school, internship may or may not be real everybody saw true colors come out and what what we did so i think you hit on something and that you have to make a positive out of it well you maybe not want to be positive you may want to be negative but you know what i'm saying <laughs> good point okay uh next we have dr shoemaker uh dean of the hospitality program at university of nevada las vegas so how has a pandemic affected your school's retention and recruitment? And how are you addressing those issues? Um, obviously a great question. And one I'm sure we're, we're all struggling with. You know, about at UNLV, probably about 25% of our students are international because obviously we're close to the West Coast and Las Vegas is a big draw for international students. So we've definitely been hurt by enrollment as as the international student population has has dropped completely um and and so that's you know we're really you know i think our the university i think is down probably 15 or 16 percent um in terms of enrollment and really we and we're probably down 20 percent what we're finding is that um students are applying late to college so we have an open enrollment at UNLV. You can pretty much, you know, get accepted to the last day of, before the school starts. But because kids aren't in the we're are not in high school right now. They're working from home. They don't have that constant reminder of the guidance counselor saying, "Have you applied to college? Have you thought about college?" So we're we're really trying to do a lot of promotion 
um, working with our partners to really recruit, you know, we're visiting, we have a director of enrollment management. She's out meeting with high schools. We obviously are doing a lot of um, stuff on the internet, trying to get kids to start thinking about applying. I mean, the good news is that even though our enrollment's down, among those people who apply and get accepted, we're having a higher, you know, we're, acceptance rate, right? So we accept the people and then they actually end up coming. So that has helped us. But in terms of enrollment, it's down. I think we, about three, two, well, last fall in 2020, we started a new curriculum. And the new curriculum basically is, we reduced a lot of our core classes. So we have only 50 credits that are required, you know, 50, 55 around there. And we have 30 credits of electives and 10 credits can be, no, excuse me, 15 credits can be a concentration. So that means in theory, you could get two concentrations plus your degree in hospitality. And so what we're looking at is as the, as, as students say, well, wait a minute, why do I want to go into hospitality? I think like every hospitality school and, and we've been, you know, the deans meet on a regular basis. We've all been talking about, well, what are the skill sets that we have in hospitality that are transferable to other industries? And I think we would all argue that everything we do in hospitality is transferable. So as we look, obviously we're looking like everybody in terms of hospitality and bringing healthcare principles into hospitality. Um, certainly senior living is something we're looking at. In Las Vegas, because of the really rise in sports, you know, beginning to think about what is there in terms of sports um, management and the venue management, you know, with the with obviously the Raiders, the Knights, et cetera. But the other thing we're really focusing on is we were very fortunate. We received a gift from Andrew and Peggy Churn, who were the founders of Panda Express. And so we're really developing a whole program around the fast casual segment. You know, I think at a lot of hospitality schools, we focus on fine dining. And no one that we found really has a whole concentration on fast casual, but that segment has really tended to grow um, during the pandemic. So we're, with the help of the churns, we're gonna be developing a whole program on fast casual. Um, we're also beginning to really look at, you know, we got another large gift from the Sam Manuel Band of Native Indians to look at gaming and especially Native American gaming, which is happening across the country. So we're not abandoning hospitality to seek other areas. We're just sort of saying that if you get a hospitality degree, you have the ability to concentrate in an area where we think there's some future opportunities. We're working with um, College of Fine Arts and Engineering and putting a degree together in experience design. Um, we have a program again with with um, engineering, business, health sciences on creating a degree in analytics. So what we're finding is that, you know, at UNLV, we're very lucky, all the deans work very closely together. So we're really putting together some joint programs that allow us to focus on the strength of each college without, without having each college to create its own area, but working together. So hopefully that, that makes sense. Um, one one other part, if you what about retention? Have you been able to keep the students? Yeah, so our retention is always very very good. I mean, we have an incredible advising team, and we work very hard on um, on making sure that you know the students meet with their advisor on a regular basis. And so our retention numbers are actually the highest in the in the university, and that's because we spend a lot of time working with our students to get them to stay involved, to stay engaged. So that hasn't been even, even with the pandemic, even with the pandemic. With the pandemic yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think it's because yeah. we had the flexibility of, you know, like, as I mentioned, I'm teaching high flex. We had a lot of, you know, we went online. So it became convenient for the student to still go to school wherever they were. Good. You know, I think the thing was I to remember about retention is that there's a sunk cost, right? So students, once they start a program, it's harder for them to leave and then try to go somewhere else because then there's the whole transferability things. So we've really tried to keep them engaged and talk to them about it's hard now, but it'll get better. Good. Uh, comments from the panelists or questions? Yes, I wanted to um, 
Stowe hosted us last year, if I'm not mistaken. It's a blur. I don't even know what year we're in anymore, but uh, it, was it was last year for the grad conference. And I mean, they're just doing amazing things at UNLV. So my hat's off to Stowe and UNLV for all of the, I mean, just fantastic progressive things that they're doing there. Um, but I wanted to add one thing that we did at UNT that I was extremely proud of from a re, uh, recruiting standpoint is that, that we created what's called, um, we're the UNT, the Eagles, it's our mascot. So we created this SOAR higher lecture series for high schools because a lot of high schools had challenges as they moved to online learning um, and they were having a lot of difficulties. So we asked all of our faculty to come up with different lectures that they would be willing to give for high school teachers and created a website with our faculty and with these various topics that we're willing to present. So I did one with another faculty member on the other side in merchandising on Disney customer service. And we had another faculty that talked about um, careers in hospitality. So that has been, I think, one of the bright spots is that we're being extremely creative and figuring out other ways to connect um, not only with our students, but with high school students as well to maintain those relationships. And the faculty absolutely love it. We'll get these emails and say, hey, can you come in in the next week or two? And even that's a, interesting for me because I was presenting to students who were online and somewhere in the classroom. And so I'm presenting to two, two different sets of students and I hear voices coming from everywhere, but it's just interesting to see what's taking place. So that was one thing that I really liked, a great idea that we had this working very well to maintain those relationships with high schools. And I was, I was gonna jump in and, and echo um, what Kim is saying is we all work so hard to get students in. We already have those programs. All of us are going through this together and um, it opened up a tremendous opportunity, you're correct, to get creative. So we actually um, created a careers uh, massive online course and uh, pushed that out from our little university and with a certificate and all of that. So people could sharpen their skills or maybe see that a leader comes from um, the brewery downtown or whatever it was. So we got, we, we too thought, how are we going to retain students, not only in our program, but how are we going to get them out into the industry back when they see it just, you know, with unemployment? So thank you. That's good. I was just going to, um, Let's go. Um, I was just going to so. say we're not going to host. Um, we're never going to host another um, grad conference again because um, Kim stole one of our best faculty members. <laughs> so, uh, if anybody comes to UNLV, they have to sign a non agreement that they're not going to. <laughs> I'm sorry. I promise you, on my top ten people for Christmas cards. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, last question, uh, Dr. Williams. How have the pandemic's negative effects on hospitality industry changed the way you approach internships, work experience requirements, or experiential learning in class, such as site visits, cooking labs, guest lectures? I know we've talked about this some, but how, how have you approached it? You know, I think um, in that sentence it said negative effects and the way I see everything is an opportunity. Going back to that creative way of doing things than, differently than the way we've done them in the past. And I think one thing I've learned is each generation is just absolutely different. What worked last year may not work this year. So we're constantly evolving. Um, but for us, just like all the other programs, we have 500 hours of pre-internship hours required and 300 hours of internship requirement. So as, as soon as, you know, um, as Allie was mentioning, the industry was hard hit. Many students who had management internships, they no longer have these opportunities anymore. Our students are being furloughed. They're panicking because we have this 800 hour requirement and they're saying, what now? So we don't wanna lose them because we have this requirement. We needed to be flexible. It was extremely important for us to do that and to alleviate their fears. So a couple of things that we did, um, we partnered with Career Services. I mean, that is a fantastic asset that's already on campus that we can work closely with. And um, they had two companies, just as everybody else did, they tapped into these two companies, Parker Dewey was one and Inside Sherpa was the other. 
so that students could apply for these virtual internship opportunities um, with one company actually paying them if they got the opportunity. Um, the other one did not. It was just an internship opportunity, a virtual internship. So that was two opportunities that we presented to students. The challenge there being that everybody needed a virtual internship. So it was very competitive for students to get these opportunities, but it did at least give us this alternative. Um, the other thing that we did was that we created a new alternative internship class for students who did not have work experience. And in that alternative internship class, uh, I was very fortunate. I would say this is probably one of the things that's very helpful for faculty is that we had to step in and do a lot of the teaching. So now we get to see what it's like in a day in the life of a faculty member. So I taught the alternative um, internship class because our faculty member was out on, on leave. And so I developed this class and what I did was created a virtual consulting experience for the students. So I partnered with Margaritaville and Lake Conroe and I asked them to give me two questions um, that our students could serve as consultants to address for them. And it was a fantastic thing. I put a created discussion board for the students where they can bounce different ideas off of helping them with creative events in the COVID environment, um, or they could help them with an FMV question. So I said, here's gonna be your experience that is on your resume once the industry recovers. So we did that as an opportunity for them and the students absolutely loved it. I also required them to get a certification, a new certification and something so that they are, are, are lifelong learners. And I expressed this to them that they have to be flexible, they have to be adaptable, they have to have additional skills ready for when the industry comes back. So all students, whether it was the um, COVID safety class through AHNLA for $5 for 20 minutes, they got certified in safety or they could take a Coursera or a MOOC class and get some type of certification. So I would share different things with them. I did one myself through USF, the, the COVID crisis class, hospitality class, and I shared that with them and did it before the holidays. So I forced them to do something beyond the classroom because I found some of the students were getting um, depressed at the fact that they had their life, it was pretty well planned. And then all of a sudden everything, you know, we put the brakes on it. And so I needed to keep them going and say, okay, things are gonna get better. What are you gonna do to be ready when that opportunity arises? Um, so I was constantly figuring out things like that for the students, staying engaged with industry. We have a virtual career fair, as was mentioned before. Uh, we allow companies to roll over their deposits from last year, and now we're, we're featuring them in classrooms and staying engaged with them to share opportunities with us. And one thing that I am very, very um, a proponent of, if somebody sends an opportunity to me, I jump on it to send them some students right away and keep that connection going with them. Because one, com one um, hotel you said, oh, I'm getting students from Missouri. And I said, okay, we're right here in Texas. Why are you going to Missouri? I love Missouri, no offense. but I have all these students who need opportunities. So now when he sends an opportunity to me, I make sure I'm sending him four to five candidates right away. So hopefully one of our students will have that opportunity before he goes out of state. Um, and let's see, am, am I missing? Oh, cooking labs. Oh my gosh, that was something else um, and a big challenge for us because with the COVID, COVID safety, measures that we had to implement on campus. So our lab could accommodate maybe 25. And now we have to minimize the number of people in the lab. So we had to increase the number of labs with less faculty um, to offer these additional sections. But our faculty member graciously jumped in, a shout out to Jody, um, but she jumped in and said, give me more sections, no problem, I'll do it. So she offered more sections, even though, even though we had to accommodate less students. So she was fantastic, but she's also great because she has an online cooking videos that she created herself. And so the student, she was able to easily, as Ali mentioned also, and everybody's mentioned that she was able to easily pivot to online and, you, and tap into those videos as a resource and supplement her instruction in that virtual environment. And I think that's something that we're all gonna have to be prepared to do, whether it's supplementing your instruction with simulations, knowledge matters, find something out there to keep the students engaged because just going in and lecturing and putting up slides that's not enough anymore. And parents, I can't tell you how many times I received messages from the president saying, parents are saying, what are your faculty doing in this class? They don't feel like the teacher is engaging enough with the class. 
So we would go in and say, look, you need to go in and set up a, a virtual office hour with the students or do something creative to keep them engaged. So I'm going to stop talking because I think I've gone over my four minutes, but that's just a few ideas for you. Good. So we've got about 15 minutes left. Uh, do we have any questions in the Q&A, Brian? We do have a question from Dr. Dobson from Cal Poly Pomona. Hi. Great presentation, all of you. Really appreciate it. Kim, I had a question for you. So how did you handle the additional workload requirements on the food prep lab with the one faculty member? I know Jody as, as well. How, how is, is she being compensated with a stipend? Is she going to have re release time in the future? Did she just do it out of the goodness of her heart? How did that work? Leah, that is a fantastic question. Um, so she did not get extra compensation and that was very difficult for me to ask her to do that, to be honest with you, because I always try to put myself in a faculty member's shoes before I ask them to do something that I'm not willing to do myself. Um, but Jody was just fantastic and she stepped up that semester and taught those extra sections gratis for us. However, this this semester, I ensured that I did not do that to her twice, and I gave her a break this semester and asked another faculty member, our restaurant is closed. So I asked the chef who taught in the restaurant to please pick up some of the sections for the lab this semester. And then that balanced it out and gave Jody a break as well, and then moved her face-to-face um, -face instruction for the lab to online to give her a break there as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We have another question from Christy Douglas, I believe from Moore Park College. There we go, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so my question is about, um, obviously we all had to shift, well, okay, my program is, a, I'm a community college faculty and our program is fully online intentionally, pre-COVID. Um, and I'm curious if any schools have felt that that this, you know, after working through the hiccups of, of converting, if this is working and this is something that their students might want to continue with um, offering online or at least, you know, partial online flexibility, because I know our students really appreciate it because many work in the industry and have unpredictable schedules and working nights and weekends. So the option to come and, you know, log in anytime during the week and do their coursework is really helpful. Thoughts on that? Yeah, this is um, Sto Shoemaker from UNLV. Um, great, great question. And, and, and I would say that online education has been around for a long time. Um, we all kind of used to laugh at University of Phoenix. Now we're suddenly saying, if we're not careful, we'll be considered University of Phoenix. And I think what, what it, this has done is it's taken the more traditional institutions like UNLV to really say, wait a minute, we have to look at multiple modes of distribution. Not everybody can come to Las Vegas. And so the approach we're taking is, is really saying, let's really make sure that if you can't come to Vegas, how do we bring Vegas to you? And I think the challenge we're all gonna face as hospitality programs is that we really, each program really has to come up with a point of differentiation because otherwise a student's gonna go, well, it doesn't matter if I go to UNLV, Michigan State, Florida International, UMass, they all have online programs. Let me see what the cost is, which ones are convenient. And, and so I think we really have to make sure that as, as leaders in academic institutions, we really begin to sort of practice what we preach in our marketing classes about differentiation, positioning and everything. Otherwise um, people are gonna go, yeah, I went to University of Phoenix, got a great education, the program worked well, there were no hiccups with the technology, everything was perfect, and at the end of the day, I got a degree. So I think the challenge is really going to be on, on us, and not just in hospitality, I think in all programs, because now suddenly going to Harvard is just as easy as going to UNLV in the online environment. So it's a real challenge we're going to be facing, because students are used to, there are going to be some students that just can't get away. And I would say also from a staffing educational standpoint of who are the faculty members? Are they comfortable with teaching? How is the delivery now that coming to light online? And you're absolutely right, Stowe, it's been around. 
um, but let's embrace it. How do we get better at that in, in, within our colleges or programs? Um, what do we do? Do we have, you know, um, a online specialists implanted? Do we do things that make sense now? Um, Cause like, yeah, we, we, we use that, we flex the high flex uh, a couple of times that's been around since 2010. And so now it comes to light, let's embrace it and let's figure out um, how best to put all of these together for these students now, our traditional students that now are dealing with being at home, being at line, online. So there's not that huge learning curve. Um, but I also think that we're gonna be ready to go face to face and have that connection as well, at least in the hospitality side of education. And can I add that um, we were looking at students now who have had more flexibility than they've had in the past and they've been asking for this for a while and we kind of were holding off because we wanted that face-to-face -face interaction with students. And I would just warn like Texas, for example, um, we were considering offering more online classes as a result of the pandemic, but then found out that if we offer greater than 50% of our curriculum online, we are now considered an online program and need additional SACS approval to, to move to this new online delivery. So there's always something you have to be mindful of. And I didn't realize this. I was so glad I reached out to someone when we were, we were first pursuing this idea because many faculty now have had a taste of this online environment. Um, and they're like, oh, this online thing isn't so bad and I can do this, but we are not ready to be viewed as an online program at this particular point in time. So we're being careful. And not only that, we're trying to make sure that the class is a good fit for online delivery. So an accounting class, a lot of those mathematical classes that may be challenging for students may not be the best ones to move to online delivery at this time. So we're making sure and being very purposeful in the ones that we select for that online delivery. Um, and also remembering classes that have high first time in college students, perhaps those classes are not best suited for online delivery. So just being very intentional in which classes we decide to offer online versus face-to-face. -face. Ryan, it looked like we got a few more questions. Okay. Yeah, I think um, this question from uh, Dr. DeWald from the Collins College, Cal Poly Pomona, is a great question for uh, John. Um, I don't know if you see the question there, but Dr. DeWald says, incredible how you got students on campus. When students, faculty, or staff got COVID, what was done for them and all those that they had contact with? Yeah, Dr. DeWald, thanks so much for the question. The, prior to coming back to campus, we had to develop a comprehensive response protocol with public health and our hospitals. So part of that was we became an arm of public health. We stood up our, an entire contact tracing uh, team in addition to a testing site. And so what that meant was instead of putting burden on the county, we were actually taking pressure off of the, the local public health agency. Um, we had very few, and I mean, out of 10,000 people, probably fewer than 10 faculty and staff um, became infected. But we did have quite a few students. And what we found after the fact was, you know, we, we set up isolation beds. We worked with our local hotels because a lot of those hoteliers, of course, had excess capacity. And so we were able to partner with them and, um, and utilize both on-campus and off-campus isolation beds. But what we found after the fact in doing what we called a symptom severity survey is that um, maybe unsurprisingly to everyone at this stage of the game, these young people were not feeling um, very serious symptoms. And so our biggest challenge became mental health and really supporting those students in isolation where many times they had zero symptoms. Oftentimes they had a day or two of very mild symptoms, you know, a runny nose, maybe, um, maybe a day of fever or something. And so then they've got uh, of a 10 day isolation. They really uh, needed time uh, you know, we had to figure out ways to engage them. And so we came up with care packages and games and a variety of things with um, different campus engagement groups to check in on those students because it, that was one of the most challenging things, keeping them academically engaged, keeping their mental health in a good space, 
while uh, they were isolated and frankly not feeling very sick. So that was probably our, our biggest challenge. But, you know, credit to our medical and public health advisors ahead of time, they helped us craft that out. So when we did experience those cases, um, you know, it wasn't a big fire drill. We were able to, to manage that reasonably. Thanks for the question. We got about we got about five more minutes. Uh, got got to take one more question or two. Ryan. Um, wow, you're making me decide. There's so many good ones. Uh, let's go with Dr. Gustin. Um, I'm being a little biased here from Cal State Long Beach. She's asking, being in the industry of hospitality, what does hospitality online look like? How do we mirror that within our programs? So it's a great question. And, and I think what it really comes down to is, is thinking about, you know, hospitality is all about crisis management, right? I mean, we can plan and plan and plan and everything goes wrong, right? The waiter drops the tray or the food doesn't arrive on time. And I think that, I think what we can really do in an online environment, especially during about COVID is, is model to the students that what does it mean to be adaptable? What does it mean to be changing? And what are the lessons that we're learning about changing and adapting in, in hospitality? So we really become role models. And, and in many ways, you know, we're lucky as faculty, right? Many of our friends who work in the industry all got furloughed or lost their jobs, right? For most of us, our life hasn't changed a lot. You know, we still have our jobs, we still pay. And it's been pretty good. So it really becomes to say, okay, how do we be empathetic to our students, to those in the industry? How do we teach them that that this is not the first crisis we're going to have in hospitality? You know, we've had it year all the time. We've we've gone ebbs and flows. And so I think the key is is to tell students and help students understand that, you know, as as you think about our industry, we've had highs and we've had lows. What are the lessons we can learn from each? each high and each low, and what does that mean for your career? And I always talk to students a lot about, because some students, they all say, I want to be in corporate, right? Because they think, well, I work in a corporate office. They think they work Monday through Friday, and they're still in hospitality, and they get to go home at five. And I always say that you have to stay close to the cash register, right? Because at the end of the day, you're either a cost or you're in revenue. And you always want to position yourself by being revenue. And, and I think that's one of the things we can really teach students is that, is that they have to be flexible. They have to always be learning. They have to always be looking around the corner for what things bad's gonna happen and how do they make sure that their career doesn't get furloughed? Because all the people who got furloughed aren't the people who are really solid and are they're good for an organization, right? And so that's how I think we can bring hospitality in is by modeling what it means to be adaptable, what it means to be flexible, what it means to take on challenges in a way that helps everybody. And to be empathetic to our employees as we are being empathetic to students, right? And I think, you know, we always get excuses from students. Oh, you know, the dog ate my paper. Can I turn it in later? Or, you know, the grandmother dies like 20 times. But we still have to be empathetic and say, yes, this is awful. But that's what we can do to help you get through this crisis and mo use that as a model for how you would work with an employee. That's how I focus on it. I don't know if that answered the question, but that's how I think about it. And I also think it could be Good. being hospitable, right? So in academia, being hospitable through some of the processes that take a little bit longer or that we don't have the authority to do because it has to go through the state um, systems. So again, I like Stowe's modeling because I think us we need to model that, especially for the students, um, to be a little more hospitable and um, and understanding. Great, thank you very much. Um, we're one oh no exactly three thirty. So I know everybody's got a lot of things to do. Thank you very much to the panel.